On the breakfast this morning, what's in a name? In what seems like waiting till teenage years before naming a child, the Nigerian government finally declares bandits terrorizing Nigeria as terrorists. We look at the significance of this. And then our Friday sports discoursing with uh, sports analysts, Wallace Scott will be joining the conversation as regards a build-up to the African Cup of Nations. And as always, we look through the newspapers and unwrap the biggest stories making headlines across Nigeria today. Thanks for joining us on The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa on the final show for this week. And of course, the uh, uh, final one for, well, first week of 2022, the final one. Um, I am Osaogi Ogbon, and we hope that you have a very interesting time with us this morning. And I am Messi Bofo. It's good to be back on your screen this morning. Absolutely. Uh, we, of course, uh, start with top trending stories, but much later on the program this morning, we're going to be looking at a late naming ceremony. Imagine naming your child when he's 19 and the significance of the name also, and that's with regards uh, the Nigerian government finally declaring a terrorist, or bandits rather, who have been terrorizing Nigerians across the northern part of the country for years now, uh, finally being declared uh, terrorists. So what exactly is the significance of this? And, um, you know, what will this really change in any way um, concerning the fight against insecurity? I also saw reports, um, I'm not sure, I think on the Daily Trust, you know, that about 60 persons were killed uh, in the last 24 hours would, of course, uh, go um, look through that and, and confirm that story. Of course, uh, Wally Scott will be joining us to discuss sports this morning, AFCON, uh, just a few days away, and we are excited. But before that, top trending stories this morning. We're starting from here in Nigeria. Uh, the Nigerian government has, of course, approved the uh, setting up of 10, uh, what are they called now? Forest reserves or wildlife reserves uh, across the country. It uh, was stated by the Minister of State uh, for Environment, Barista Sharon Ikeazo. They're called 10 national parks, actually. And this is with regards to uh, saving wildlife across Nigeria. It's not a conversation that we have a lot um, in the country, not very much that we talk about wildlife. You know, you might hear it in, in Kenya mostly, uh, but not in Nigeria. And so, of course, uh, it was stated at the launch of the largest wildlife uh, conservation campaign in Africa, which was led by a group called Wild Aid. The theme for this year is um, keep them wild, keep us safe. And it basically is to reduce the uh, illegal sale of wildlife and bushmeat in particular um, across <laughs> Nigeria. You know, the likes of the pangolins that we've spoken about uh, you know, sometime on this platform also, which are going extinct and are still being hunted and sold uh, here in Nigeria. It was also stated uh, that, um, you know, less than uh, 50 lions, which currently exist in the country, less than 50 lions, less than 100 gorillas, less than 500 elephants, less than 2,300 uh, chimpanzees uh, that are left in the wild in Nigeria. There's no cheetahs, there's no giraffes, there's no rhinos, uh, which is not a very, very good picture with regards to wildlife here in Nigeria. And so the government has gone ahead to make these moves and approved and, uh, 10 national parks uh, to protect this wildlife. And, um, you know, these are going to be situated in some of our forest reserves in Nigeria. Well, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a brilliant one, if you ask me. But usually with us, you always want to ask uh, how well are we good at, you know, maintenance? That will be, you know, the culture of maintenance. I mean, I think I, I have, I don't think I, I have, you know, visited and that's uh, due to a production that I had some time ago, uh, you know, trying to project the need for us to protect, you know, the wildlife and all of that. So one of the uh, packs, the uh, Wildlife Conservative, somewhere in Boki local government in Cross River State, Butatong. Well, you know, the question would always be, because I, I was privileged to be in, you know, that particular, you know, camp and the area. And the question again is the maintenance culture. You know, we, that's really not, we're not great on that. We, we, we need to, you know, top, uh, we need to be on top of our game. So as much as we're saying we want to increase, establish 10 more parks, it sounds very interesting and very brilliant, but, you know, what's the maintenance culture? How far have we fared? Because um, visiting that particular, you know, location and staying there for a bit, 
uh, didn't really look like anything was really, really happening. It looked like a very deserted area. And you could probably see that those who were managing the affairs or calling the shot at the time had done a great job. But of course, being left to the hands of government, you know, to maintain and all of that, uh, it's really, really um, horrible. And the should have lots of gorilla. Uh, you know, in that particular spot. And then there are laws that whoever takes anything, because this is actually a reserve area. You're not supposed to kill, even if it's a snake, you're not supposed to kill anything. Uh, you're not supposed to, you know, take out anything. I mean, that area is a no-go. Another issue, again, we should be looking at, which we're not very strong at, is implementation and ensuring that people are obeying all of this. Because you have, um, these areas are very co close to communities where um, you have farming as a major one for all of them. And so people would always go into these bushes and then want to kill hunters and what have you. So but implementation is also a great one as uh, we would need to uh, threaten that. We need to ensure that we're big on implementation mm -hmm. and also big yeah. on maintenance uh, so we can actually achieve the goal at the end of the day. So it, it goes beyond just saying we want to have national 10 national parks, but how far have we fed with the ones that we have? Well, uh, well um, in a proper national park, I don't think anybody will, will be farming. Um, you know, if you look at the ones outside Nigeria, the, there's a Kruger <laughs> National Park, there's a couple mm -hmm. of them in, in um, other African countries uh, that people actually go for tourism. And tourism is one of the things that I also was going to, you know, would mention um, as the value of having these national parks, aside, you know, keeping the animals alive and keeping, you know, these endangered species um, alive, um, we could also use this, you know, as, um, you know, a, a tourism spot in Nigeria, which we... Have, we we haven't we have, really paid attention to. You haven't seen it nice. <laughs> um, the, of course, uh, Ministry for uh, uh, Information and, uh, and, uh, culture, to, and Culture and Tourism basically has played almost zero efforts, um, not almost zero, if there's anything less than zero with regards to tourism in Nigeria, um, that's exactly where they, you know, I would rate them. Um, and so that's one of the gains and the positives of you know, things like this. Even if I also believe that some of these statements are really just made you know, because there's a group that came to visit the president, they had to find something nice to say to them and very likely will not be actually implemented. Because one of the things that you mentioned is not just about saying it. It's about being able to actually maintain a national park. It's not, you know, simply giving space for lions to run around and look for antelopes to eat. It's mm. really about maintaining... <laughs> lions looking for antelopes to eat. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's honestly because I know that, the, you know, those ones outside, you know, other African, East African countries, they're really not just a wild space that you've kept there for people, for them to live in. You actually have to maintain it. And I'm not saying that you have to sweep the whole national park every morning, but... Um, they have to be um, people who truly understand wildlife and, you know, conservationists and, you know, who are, who are skilled in that regard that will be able to ensure that the national park is running and running successfully. We should look at, you know, how other, uh, other you know, things that have been left in the hands of the Nigerian government have fared in the last, you know, de couple of decades. And we can already tell the likelihood of this one, you know, look at trains. We only started running trains again a couple of years ago. And people are already complaining about the mismanagement of the... Uh, the railway service. So you cannot, you know, I, don't, I don't, I will feel bad for any elephant that finds himself in that park, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> even if, but what, like, like I said, you know, you, you're, you, not, you're not necessarily going to be sweeping the place every morning and looking for food for them. It's you, a natural you, park. It's a place I, I really don't exist, know. You know, there was a time, mm, you remember a time where, you know, the picture of a lion actually surfaced I was from a particular state. Also. Yeah, yeah, you know, from a zoo. Yeah. Uh, what state was it again? I don't remember what it was. A kid's state. Name or any one of those states. states. It's pretty much the same. So the, the lion really looked lion. malnourished. I mean, really, really lean. And I felt so sorry for the lion because I know usually state-run zoos, not even national. You know, it's not federal. So, so I mean, this is just mentioning to say that uh, that lion is really hungry. Just imagine, uh, you just taking a stroll to the zoo and, and by chance yeah. you just have the hem of your garments it's, close it's, by. It's a lot of it work. It's, a, it's not just mm. it's not just word of mouth. There's a lot of work, you know, to get those things set up. When people go to other African countries, you know, and they want to take a, a, a drive through the wild um, and they have those vehicles that take them. I've never been in all of those things, but they have those vehicles, you know, that drive them through the park. You can see the lions, you can see the zebras, you can see the antelopes, you know, and, and all of that. You can even stay and watch them, you know, uh, hunt or watch them feed and all of that. It's fun. It's tourism. And people pay thousands and thousands. I'm sure those countries make, you know, millions of dollars, you know, every year from just tourism um, and, and all of that. But in Nigeria, we have a lot of work that needs to be done. When we had we, the conversation about pangolins being hunted in Nigeria, Nigeria is a... A, a trafficking route for um, endangered species. Pangolins in their thousands are killed every year in Nigeria and exported to Asia. 
we that you know is something that we need to fix and it's not just by you know saying it it actually needs to be fixed mm -hmm. people need to know that there's a penalty for hunting these things they need to find a way to catch them the same way the ndla is chasing drugs that's the same effort which put into protecting wildlife in nigeria if you're trying to be serious it's sad that we don't have i mentioned earlier we don't have any rhinoceros we don't have any gorillas we don't have any no they're gorillas um, they're gorillas in you well, know the wild age there's no gorillas maybe don't do no no, no because if, if you take a look i mean like i mentioned you know Fish. that particular uh, community is a local government in cross river state mm. Uh, in Buki, and so you have the, that's that's a conservation, and in that particular, what they really have really are the gorillas, you know. So it's uh, it's a conversation where um, conservation well, where you have the gorillas there. So so you have all of these species. Okay, well th those those okay. I think what this report is talking about is in the wild, not okay. in you know protected areas. Yes, yeah. in, in so so yes, you you have yeah. these conserved areas where you have the gorillas. Yeah, and and and, and, and of course they look very. You know, um, there's a there's also a documentary done by Tayo. I know. Um, that showed, I think what was called the, the, the Hyena Men or so. It's on YouTube. It's a very beautiful uh, documentary that shows uh, places in Nigeria where they, um, um, they have these animals, very wild animals, but they are under some control, under some spells, so they don't bite. They don't, I don't know what it is. <laughs> but it's a very, very beautiful documentary. I think everyone should uh, check out, um, you know, just to see that there's, there's still, you know, is a lot that should be done. Espe especially, especially when we're talking about you know diversification of our economy, I mean we should begin to look at you know that aspect as a means of you know generating revenue. Like you talked about, it would really be great that people would just want to you know take a stroll, uh, you know travel to Nigeria just to have a feel. And when they're coming, there's something to look out for because most times you find that people come in and then you ask yourself, you know, what are the um, spots that you can visit? And some of the spots that you already have are not really being taken care of, and yeah. so we need to do better you know with you know maintenance and ensuring implementation and enforcement take a look at the zoos across nigeria go to a zoo in your state and take a look at what it look, uh, you know it is like <laughs> um and see how the animals are faring you know so you can have a picture or have an idea of what it might be like if you know we actually do do some of these things and some people would also argue that in nigeria's conversation right now that is not one of the top 100 things that we should even be talking about there's a lot more that the country needs but i think there's space you know to also have those conversations and to also invest in some of all those things um in the country also talking nigeria we have been rated eight out of 162 countries suffering from mass killings and the sad part is that this same body predicts that it will continue in 2022 uh, we've been rated um, eight and uh, only below pakistan india yemen afghanistan uh, dr congo guinea and ethiopia it's not a very good look it's uh, it was done by a group called the early warning project um, um you know powered by the simon scotch uh, center for the prevention of genocides um nigeria currently ranks eight and um in one luckily one of the things that we're going to be talking about this morning is the uh, naming of um, the naming ceremony that was done a few days ago by the Nigerian government, naming bandits officially, uh, calling them terrorists. So hopefully that might be the answer. And, you know, our guest this morning, who's a security expert, will be able to shed more light on it to let us know if naming them terrorists will maybe be the answer to the problems um, concerning mass killings in Nigeria um, moving forward. Mm -mm, but, you know, uh, yesterday, so a lot of questions would actually probably be raised and some people want to say, uh, what is the yardstick? What criteria? How did they arrive at that, you know, uh, rating, as it were, being that we're eight? I mean, you look at uh, countries that we are, uh, that are below us. So you have the likes of Chad, you have the likes of uh, Somali, you have the likes of Iran, Iraq, and some of, you know, Syria. Some of these countries are war-torn zones, and then you're asking yourself, you know, how come Nigeria is on top of it? But if you also want to look at the reality also with us, what we're faced with, apart from the fact that you have killings, you know, emanating from bandits, uh, that of, you know, Boko Haram, Iswap, and what have you, you also want to talk about court-related killings, armed robbery, and all sorts. So, you know, retro killings, as it were. So if you look at the different classification of, you know, killings, it, it probably might just make sense. But as usual with the Nigerian government, it would definitely, rather than look at this report and find a way of how to, you know, ensure that we threaten and, you know, go against the odds that we already have, we we'll rather want to begin to say, oh, it's a baseless, you know, argument and mm -hmm. some elements who are not really interested with the, uh, you know, administration of President Muhammad Buhari are really out here, you know, to topple the government and they don't like his face and they don't like everything around, you know, like Muhammad and all of that. So it would just be that kind of argument. So usually if you have all of those reports, it's important. If you think that it's not okay, then it's important to do your own, you know, verification and your own survey and, you know, find out.
of what the actual thing is, but and also find a way to work against the odds. But I don't know. Let's see how oh. all of that pans out. But I know that they're killings, but whether or not, you know, in that ranking, like I, like I mentioned earlier on, one would like to know what are you, the yardsticks that we used to measure, you know, all of this. Which, which is important, you know, but also to, to mention, um, I understand you, you uh, named Syria and a couple of other places. Um, Pakistan, I believe. Uh, these aren't necessarily war-torn. You know, Syria no, has, no, no, Syria's had its A few of them. No. Yeah, I mean, Syria's had its own struggles, you know, um, a few years ago. But I don't think I've heard anything about killings in Syria or, or bombings or anything like that in the last, you know, one year. In, but you, I mean, but, but you can also still take out the fact that, you know, there are still some other crimes and criminality that's going on. Yeah, but it's different from mass killings. Mm. You know, it's, it's very, very different from hearing that 40 people died you know, every other weekend, you know, in a village someplace, by bandits, by terrorists, by Boko Haram, by kidnappers and whatnot. It's a, it's a little different, you know, for countries that are completely water. In Ethiopia, yes, you know, is, well, it's, 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 it's above, above us. us, you know, on, on, on the ranking, mostly because of the uh, Tigrayan, you know, rebels and the fight Crisis. that they've been having um, with the government, you know, and a couple of other countries. I'm not sure much about Guinea um, or even India, but you know, every now and then you would hear that there are things, tribal wars or, you know, um, a fight with a, a group against the government that is going on. Um, and Nigeria's you know, situation is pretty much, you know, pretty much the same, you know, but ours is a, a, a conversation on terrorism, you know, and, and simple just killing of Nigerians recklessly for, for absolutely no reason. Um, those other countries that you mentioned, the Syrians and the likes, have been reasonably calm. Um, uh, randomly, every now and then, you might hear that a bomb exploded somewhere. Yeah, so so um, so it just, I mean, it just really calls for. But you wouldn't for, hear that terrorists are wiping out villages. So in any so, of those so so it really calls for, um, you know, it really calls for, you know, because over time, there's also this argument about reportage. I mean, yeah. some people will want to say that as much as you know, there's. The, the, the level of reportage and the way these uh, killings have been brought out, if you look at it in its real sense, mostly sometimes it's not it. So you could probably have a report of saying 20 persons were killed. And if you look at it, it probably might just be less or even more than that. Uh, but I'm just trying to say that however you want to look at this or you look at it, uh, these countries that I have actually mentioned, whether or not they are currently, you know, faced with war issues or not, but these are countries where you would always, whenever you talk about killings and mass killings, you would always think about them to be, you know, be topping the chart. So it is really... Uh, the countries that I actually mentioned, I'm saying that whether or not they're experiencing war at the time, I mean, naturally or generally, whenever you think about these countries, um, the first thing that would come to mind would be the fact that if there's such ranking that there will probably, you know, just be a little bit above Nigeria. That's what I'm saying. No, right? so I, I don't agree so, with that. No, I mean, so I, I'm, saying that, I'm saying that whether or not they're experiencing war, yeah. You get you get my point. Whether or not they're experiencing, you say that yes, of course we, we don't have any you know serious case of mass killing and what have you in terms of war. And I'm saying that of course whether or not right now they might just be experiencing pockets of killings and what have you. But naturally, or you know before now, whenever you mention these countries, you want to see them as you know there's a lot of killings going there. That not that Nigeria will be topping the chart at this point and they'll be below. So it is just strange that we didn't used to be in this position, but now we're topping the chart below this country. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. You don't get my point, but it's fine. It's okay. Yeah. But, yeah I mean, the moral of the story is that, you know, when we have conversations on countries, Nigeria should never be grouped um, among some of these So, so that's what I'm saying. I'm I, saying I, that prior to this time, we used to be below the skies. The and, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, now that you... Every now and then you might hear of a bomb blast going off in some country, you know, but I, I don't also equate that to, I mean, a random bomb blast that goes off twice a year. I wouldn't equate that to mass killings. Um, no, people, um, there would always be casualties. I mean, you can't even take that. Even the fact that anyway. we're going to be using Tucano jets right now, and there will be civilian casualties. So, <laughs> so we don't uh, misunderstand ourselves. Okay. Um, that's, you know, exactly what the story is. 162 countries and Nigeria has been ranked eight. Uh, moving away from that, let's come, you know, still in the country, but now to a very famous, popular pastor. But not because of his miracles, but because of every, you know, quarter, it seems like there's a new scandal. Maybe twice a year, maybe three times a year, Pastor Biodun Fatoibo uh, has been once again called out. Um, but this time it's uh, being called out for having a very, very toxic, abusive relationship with some of his staff. Um, um, the last time that we heard his name um, was because, of course, of um, him being called out for sexual assault and for um, some of all of that by the wife of... Um, a Tim, very popular Nigerian singer. Timmy Dracolo? Yes. Timmy Dracolo. Is it Timmy Dracolo? Yes. Yes, I was going to say 
Um, but now he's being called out by a member of the church and a staff of the church, a part of their choir, um, you know, who has called him out for uh, abandoning staff, for not paying staff for months, is our allegations as um, were put out yesterday, for not paying out, uh, paying salaries for months and months and months and still expecting the staff to continue to work and continue to put in, you know, their services to the church. Um, even got to a point where she's alleging that they were kicked out of the residence that were, they were given. And um, this continued until uh, one of them eventually died because she couldn't afford hospital bills at, um, you know, when she fell ill. Um, this, you know, stories came out yesterday and of course it was also mentioned allegedly that Pastor Biodu had made attempts and made, um, you know, um, well, Attempts, you know, at this person who eventually has passed, you know, because she what attempts are you talking about? Um, um you know, the attempts I'm referring no, I to. have no idea. I mean, I mean he it's, has, it's you know, tried to sexual attempt, yes, I, I sexually, mean, you know, relationship attempt, sexual attempts. I'm not sure which one exactly. Well, could, could he be the person um, she was kicked out? Um, yes, so I mean, so, so what, what the story looks like is that you know, when she rejected his, his um, advances, you know, advances. You know, then, you know, he became or she became his enemy number one and mm. then became, you know, oh, he started to treat her, very, you know, very wrong. Um, but it's still left for the, the church or pastor, not the church now, for, for Pastor Fatou Ibo to respond and clarify on some of these issues and some of these allegations. Um, and it's not a great way to start 2022. Mm. It well, seems like he has one or two every year. <laughs> so maybe it might just be more for 2020. I mean, we just started. Today is just a seven. So let's see how all of these things unfold. But yesterday was really a long read for me. And the bottom point is this. First of all, it's very eminent that he's going to, you know, come through and, of course, put out there would always be some form of defense. And like, you know, uh, the church member that was that put out that statement and she said, uh, one of the things she said is, as much as I don't have evidence to establish all of this, but you know, the truth would always come through. Mm. And she felt very uh, pain. You, if, you, if you read the write-up, I mean, there's so much. You could feel the pain because usually with writing, you could, you could feel the thoughts of the writer. And I felt so much pain, anger, anguish. I felt, you know, how she felt. And the, 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 as much as I was just trying not to drop any comment, you know, on that page, because, you know, in my mind, I'm like, what is this again? It just boils down to the fact that, you know, a lot of people would say we don't believe in any religion. I mean, just recently you heard Whiskey saying, I'm not a I don't believe in religion. Uh, and if you want to talk, I keep saying that the tenets, whether it's Christianity, whether it's, you know, uh, the Muslim religion, you find out that the tenets are not different. We talk about love at the end of the day. For those who believe the Bible and who read the Bible, you want to agree with me that the Bible says that wherever Jesus went, he was doing good. He fed the poor. He, he gave them food when they were hungry. He, he sat down and saw them and he thought that they were very hungry and he gave them food and he said that should make food for them. He healed the, the sick. So everywhere Jesus was going, he was doing good. And so... It just shows you that everything that we should do, whatever religion that does not respect human being and does not love and care for human being, I don't know what that religion stands for because every religion, no matter what religion it is, it talks about love. And it's really, really sad to see that most times we don't care about the people that lay the egg, you know, the, the, the hen that lays the golden egg, but we care about the work done. So it happens in a lot of churches. For real, you, you have people who don't really care about the people who are working, but they care about the work being done. And so nobody cares when you don't show up in church, but they care about the fact that you're not in church. And then they begin to think that you've become the, the vessel of, you know, you've become a child of the demon or the devil. The devil is using you, but nobody's asking why you're not in church. Have you eaten? Are you hungry? You know, because these are, this are some of the basic things. So those who are claiming that they love Jesus and they are following Jesus and they are preachers of Jesus should, you know, begin to look at the life of Jesus for real, the things that he did. They were not, you know, rocket science. They were just uh, real things when he lived on earth. So um, it is really, really sad. I, well, I, I had a lot of people giving some testimonies in the comment section saying that she was such an amazing and fantastic singer. And if that report is anything to go by, it's really, really sad. But however, yeah. uh, we're also waiting to, you know, to hear the response. Yeah, and of course, person. to get, you know, complete clarity on exactly what happened um, in the you know, last uh, few years or months before this person eventually passed. Uh, it was uh, a, music, a music group, uh, I believe, that was being funded by the church. But according to them... They weren't actually getting any funding from the church. They weren't getting any support from the church. The church allegedly, um, you know, had mentioned that they had invested about 100 million naira, according to um, you know what she put out, and was asking that they pay back the 100 million naira. 
Um, and then, of course, the person in question now stated that there was none of such investments. They had to pay their own flight tickets for concerts. They had to, you know, feed themselves. They had to, uh, you know, um, you know, pay for their own hotels and whatnot while they uh, worked in the church um, musical group. Um, of course, um, we'll follow the story and would uh, be, of course, we're ready to give you updates whenever they uh, land. But for now, those are top trending stories. Welcome to 2022, Pastor Biodun Fatoyimbo. Uh, we will take a short break. When we come back, let's go through the papers this morning and see what major stories have made headlines. Gina Johnson, as always, will be joining us. Good morning and welcome once again.